Okay, welcome to our monthly constituent meeting. And uh, we have to apologize. I should apologize because I did the announcing. We thought we were going to have a Zoom conductivity tonight. So we didn't find out until yesterday that it wasn't going to be here and it was before I could do front porch form again. So, and it wouldn't matter for me to do it today because people wouldn't have read it yet. So there could be, I don't know, bunch of people out there trying to come in and they won't be able to and I have no way of knowing who they are so I feel bad about that but glad you can make it tonight uh, anyway so what we do if you haven't been here before although I think you haven't been here before uh, is Edie and I will just talk a little bit about what we're working on in our committees and things like that and then uh, we get open up to questions or comments or whatever it is it's just a, an opportunity to have a conversation okay and since i went first last time oh i don't know that i'm ready you don't know if you i can go That's you go fine. first please all right i'm representative trevor squirrel and i'm i'm in my fourth biennium this is the eighth year uh that i've been in, this, in the state house and uh my first four years were in natural resources the environmental side of things and the last four years have been on appropriations and uh, members in the appropriations committee actually break up pieces of state government so we have responsibility for certain budget portfolios i have the criminal justice system which is everywhere from the department of corrections to judiciary courts states attorneys defender general's office crime victim services all all those elements that, that, that flow into the criminal justice system in vermont I also have the Agency of Natural Resources, so I have all the environmental things also. It's a number, quite, quite a few things, but I've been there for a few years now, so I, it, I've gotten to know it, so it's not too overwhelming. Uh, my committee, my standing committee, which is appropriations, uh, obviously we're appropriating money. We have a, our budgets have been in the $8 billion range in the last number of years. And uh, process-wise, when we come into the session, we do a mid-year adjustment to the budget, which is called the bus bu budget adjustment. <coughs> we have worked through that process. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we vote it out, vote it on the floor, and then it goes to the Senate. And the Senate gets to look at what we've, the work that we've done. And they usually don't agree. And, uh, and, and so what will happen, they came back and said, you know, we want to do something different with the, the money that you appropriated. And so we have a conference committee where the two uh, committees come together, appoint three people from each committee to go in a room, so to speak, and make a decision about and find those compromises around uh, some of the thoughts we had about where, where resources should be allocated. We're in that process right now going into conference committee. Since then, we received the budget proposal from the governor and which we've received that and now we start working on the budget and going through all the different areas of the budget and we will likely finish up hearing from all the committees and departments by the end of next week we then ask committees of jurisdiction like what Edie sets on and her, her role we'll look at their pieces and think the pieces in the budget that they oversee and they'll give us feedback on that so we're getting the agencies and departments come in or, or uh, other organizations speaking to us and then getting that feedback and then we'll work through where we want to allocate those resources we have to work within a certain box we can't operate in the deficit so we get a consensus forecast the, the legislature has an economist and the administration has an economist the two of them get together and decide what the forecast is going to be for revenues in the state of Vermont. It happens in January and it happens in July. In January, we heard backs and there was increased revenue over and above the initial production. So it gave us another $30 million to work with. We cannot go beyond that box. Now, there's some financial things that we can do to move money around, and you know this very well. And, and, uh, and, and make it work, and particularly with all the federal money flowing around, and with the, uh, which is interesting because the federal government's 
changes their guidance on a regular basis too. So we're always recalibrating what we can do with funds, like move federal money over here, and free up general fund money, which is uh, uh, more flexible. So we're going through that process. It'll be about an $8.4 billion budget. We'll eventually go to uh, get to a point where we're voted out of our committee and it'll go through that whole process again. Senate will look at it, disagree with a number of things, and then we'll get together in May to decide what we want to do. It goes off to the governor, and the governor hopefully signs it, and we all go home. So that's where we are right now. Um, and I'm Edie Granning, and I am in my first biennium, and I serve on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. And I was just, I, I'm exhausted. I apologize in advance if I'm not totally coherent. Um, <laughs> but I was just looking back at agendas to see what we've been doing because um, this week for me has been all about um, education and the budget for that's coming forward and um, House Bill 850, which is not part of my committee, but it changes how, um, how we're going to go forward with our school budgeting for this year. So that's been kind of my personal focus in the legislature and understanding that and figuring out what's going on with that. We can talk about that if you want. Um, but in my committee, we've been working on data privacy. Um, so Vermont does not have a data privacy bill right now. And there are, I think, 14 other states that have, that have them in place right now. And we are working um, on Connecticut's model and updating it with um, um, pieces from Oregon and um, other states that have more uh, better definitions on what everything is and how it works. And we have been working with um, the folks who really want more data privacy and the folks who really don't want anything to change and trying to understand whose argument makes more sense for Vermont in which circumstance and really trying to put a bill together that will work for Vermont because we know we can't do what they have in California um, and we know we don't want to do what they have in some other places but we want to look at a regional and so if we base it on um, Connecticut and that's what a lot of states are basing it on and they're in our region then we think that's going to be better for businesses and better for Vermonters so that's been the bulk of um, my work for the past couple of weeks um, you know, we've had a, a few small bills that we have passed out of committee um, one to help um, to help housing get developed which would allow for surety bonds in housing which is new for Vermont but they do it in other places um, in the US and in the world um, and um, we are looking at our budget so we have been meeting with all of the different, not all, a lot of the different groups that um, have workforce development and uh, higher learning, the colleges in Vermont. I'm just trying to think who's come in. And the um, RPCs, the regional planning commissions, the regional development commissions, um, they've all been coming to us to talk about what they need and then the um, Agency of Commerce and Community Development has, you know, because that's these these are the groups whose budget our committee has purview over. So, um, just a lot. And you know, you go into committee and you're like, okay, so what are you talking about now? Let's figure it out and change gears and go forward. So, um, it's been busy. Okay. <clears throat> this is where we open up for questions or comments. Uh, just to let you know, if I, I didn't mention it earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a little bit of a cold. Uh, we go to 7 o'clock. Or unless we all run out of questions and we'll be out earlier. I would like to talk more about the school situation. I'm very confused. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe you just talk a little, a little more. I would be happy to do an overview you, and an update on where we are right now. Great, thank you. So the overview is back in 2022, <coughs> and even before that, but in 2022, we, um, the legislature passed Act 127. And what Act 127 does is it changes the funding formula so that um, what we used to do is fund students based mostly on the age of the student. So it costs less to educate um, an elementary school student. It costs more to, to educate a high school student. 
Um, there's a little bit of money for poverty, a little bit of money for other things. And then we pulled um, special education out of that completely and are doing that with block grants. So that's how we've been doing it. And then for 127, we said that's not really what it costs to educate students. It costs more to educate students who are coming from poverty. It costs more, oh, and we had small school grants before too. Um, it costs more in areas where there's a sparsity in population. There just isn't, aren't enough students to make a big population. It costs more for English language learners. It does cost more for a high schooler than an elementary schooler, but not as much, and that's not the only focus. So they changed the way we raise tax dollars. All of that's the easy part. And then <laughs> what they did is, because districts like ours that don't have much poverty, um, and there are a number of these in the state, it would be difficult to have the same amount of money in the schools as it would did before because other schools should be getting should be able to raise more money because they have more poverty in their districts. So they had a five year um, change into the system. And for those five years, if you kept your budget um, up to a 5% increase for per pupil spending, you could have a tax rate, up to a 10%, you could have a tax rate cap of 5%, which means that any money you spend that's more than 5% of your tax rate, or of your previous tax rate, you wouldn't, your district wouldn't be charged for it. It would be spread throughout the state because that's how we, that's how we, we, the way, the way education funding works in the state is our property taxes all get pooled into the education fund along with um, lottery and sales and use tax and some other tax. Oh, um, non-homestead. So your, our property taxes and then business and other property, all of that. Gets, so it all gets put into a pot and then it gets sent out based on whatever that local school budget is. So nobody tells, nobody in the state tells schools how much they should be spending for students. Every individual school district says, this is what it costs to educate students here. They put a budget together, they send it to the state. The state figures out how much money is in the education fund, sends it back out to towns and says, you locally have to raise more money to cover. And it's not, it, it is based on your budget, but it's also based on all of the budgets statewide. It is not a simple system. If you don't understand what I just said, it's okay, <laughs> because it took me three years to understand it serving on the school board. It's, it's really complex, and it's complex designed to make it more equitable. You know, flat tax is easy to understand, but everybody pays the exact same, and if you can afford more, you still pay the same as somebody who can't, right? So the more complex, often, sometimes, it can be more equitable, okay? Okay, so now we're back to today, and we've just had a lot of inflation, um, we have had incredible increases in um, health insurance rates statewide, 16.5%. There's now a statewide um, contract for all teachers and support staff for health insurance. Um, we've had wages going up um, because everything is costing more. Um, and we have significantly higher social-emotional issues happening in schools and fewer supports in communities. So. Um, the social supports in town are decreasing and schools are required to educate the students. So you have to provide the supports even if you don't have them. So it costs more today to educate students. So in December, um, there was an estimate that said that it is going to cost us $200 million, $280 million, a lot more than normal. Normally it's about a $70 million increase, so $200 or more million dollar increase is way more than double, right? Almost three times. Yeah, three more than three times what it would, what it would normally cost in a year because of this 5% cap and because all these costs are going up. So the legislature just a few weeks ago said, we can't let the education fund have this much pressure. If the education fund can't, the education fund can, will grow as much as we spend, but if we continue to grow the education fund, there won't be money for anything else. And so we have to change the mechanism in the law so that the 5% cap is gone. And what they decided to do, 
um, is in districts like ours where our tax capacity is decreasing, they would give us a, a cents off for a few years, for five years. So we would still have a gradual move into this new formula, but it's not as significant as a flat cap to say your taxes won't go up more than this amount. Your taxes will go up, it'll just, you'll have a, de a, a cents off decrease. Is anybody still with me? Kind of, sorta. No, I was with you until that part. Until that I part. I don't understand what that. So I understand any of the sense off. Yep. So I'll explain that specifically. So in 2024, the way that they computed pupils, we had whatever percentage it was. In 2025, they changed the way they compute the number of pupils you have based on poverty, based on sparsity, based on English language learners, and so that difference for us was 13%. So we have a 13% reduction in students, kind of, compared to all of the other schools in the state and all of the other students in the state. So, so because we have a 13% tax capacity reduction, we're gonna get 13 cents off our tax dollars, our tax rate before the CLA is, is in here. So straight on, 13 cents off and then 80 percent of that amount next the following year 60 percent of that amount the year after that so it's the gradual step down until we get to zero deduction did i explain that okay explain that yeah kind of sort of so um, at the end of five years yep we won't have a we won't have a benefit but it's the same process, right? It's the, the same school step. The board, but it's the budget, it goes to town meeting. That didn't we change. Say yes, that's all the same. Then that goes to the state, and then the state has to kick the money back to fund the school, right? None of that changed. The only thing that changed for this year is how do we make sure that the education fund can support student learning in Vermont? Mm -hmm. And with that 5% cap, it, um, there was no incentive the incentive was for every district in the state to spend up to that up to that amount that they could yeah. because nobody specifically had to pay for that amount of money so that incentive encouraged districts to spend more than they more than the five percent right? more than more than a they normal might otherwise have spent. they might yeah. otherwise have spent right i mean it no district is spending for anything that isn't high need but it's do you need it right this minute, right? So we had things in our budget, in the MMU budget, um, boiler update, you know, boiler repairs, and um, you know, other you know, roof repairs and things like that. That we might not need to do this year, but we need to do in the next five years or four years, right? But because this year it wouldn't cost our taxpayers as much because of that cap, we thought it made sense to put it in there because it was fiscally responsible to our taxpayers. But every district did that, which meant that the Ed Fund had too much pressure. So now they're saying, don't do that. So taking my, taking my legislative hat off and putting my school board hat on, because I serve on the school board, um, the school board is looking to modify the budget to reduce it so that it won't cost taxpayers as much because there is more, a higher cost locally to spending that money this year. Might mean we have to bond in a couple of years, but maybe there will be construction funds from the state and we won't have to bond as much. But we have to kind of see what happens with that. Yeah, I, I, I would just add two things to that, why we're seeing this increase. And he's done a good job of pointing them out, but two other things are that we had surplus monies in the last couple of years. Thank and you. so we bought, uh, uh, so we uh, had, had more money going into the ad fund and what was a surplus, right? And uh, the other thing is we had federal money called the ESSER money. So I couldn't even tell you what the acronym is anymore, but there were three stages of that money, which was quite a bit of funding flowing into the schools because of the pandemic, right? And all of this stuff's gone away. And that, that's also contributing to... Uh, I mean, if we weren't buying down those tax increases the last couple of years, we wouldn't be looking at such a high rate right now. Yeah. So it's so so, a little bit like the conversation with the DMV fees that everyone 
price foul because it went up 20 percent, but the administration has never had a fee increase for the last 10 years, and so all of a sudden we said we're just going to do it, take care of it, the fund programming. Sorry to digress and go no, to DMV, so but, but those are the kinds of things that do happen yeah. sometimes in government. So four years ago, our tax rate in the Mount Mansfield School District was 1.47. Three years ago, it was 1.48. Two years ago, it was 1.36. Last year, it was 1.21. And this year, we're estimating it's going to be right back around 1.36 again, 1.35, something like that. So if you look at it over the ter a longer term, you can see that it's within the rate, the range that we've been. It's not even back what it was five years ago. Um, but it feels like a lot because we paid so much less the last last year. It's going to be about the same as it was two years ago. So what's the bottom line in terms of... Can I go to uh, this gentleman because he put his hand up before. I just want to make sure he had a chance. Yeah. Well, thank you. I wasn't on... Um, school uh, oh okay you got a different budget, question so we should do yeah. your question okay great <laughs> thank yeah. you so so if you're asking me what the school budget is going to be i can't answer that today because until the law passed 850 which is the modification that we were just talking about passed out of the house yesterday it is in senate committees today and tomorrow and maybe tuesday and then it will go to the senate floor and the senate will have to pass it and then the governor will have to sign it and then the school district will decide if, if the school board will decide if they're going to reduce the budget, which I'm pretty sure we are, and then we will know. So I'm, my estimate is about 1.35, 1.36, assuming all of that happens. That's the best I can do today. Yeah. So it will it still happen by um, town meeting day? Uh, the vote will be pushed to after town meeting day. We're looking at the um, the first Tuesday in April right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This I, is about education, if I may. Yeah, okay. You certainly <laughs> may. I just don't want to hit 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if I may, if you guys don't know who this is, Floyd Nace, he was, he was a rep before. Ten years back in the day. Yeah. Johnson and Eaton. Yeah. Now I live. Now he lives in Jericho. So, <laughs> um, so once upon a time, there was a thing called Act 47. And Act 47 was written to address the fundamental problem in Vermont education, which is we have too few students, too many schools, and too many faculty members. Um, that's. That's the fundamental problem. We can tweak our education formula a hundred different ways, and in the final analysis, we haven't addressed the fundamental problem. And the legislature, this is not you guys, but the legislature dropped the ball, in my estimation, and I, I believe yours too, when we didn't That's why I'm sitting here. close schools, <laughs> when we didn't encourage districts to close schools. Mm -hmm when we allowed places like Stowe to become their own thing instead of being part of a larger school district. So there's a, the fundamental problem remains. We have too few students. It's not a growing student body, it's a shrinking student body. We have the highest per pupil cost per student in the country. And we're not addressing that fundamental issue. And I think it's time. I mean, it's like back in the day, back in the 70s, some courageous people in the legislature and elsewhere decided there were too many high schools in Vermont and that the little high schools like in Cambridge and other places like that, they weren't able to offer a robust curriculum and a larger school could. So they closed some schools. It was, there was outrage. There was blood flowing. It was horrible. We're going to destroy our communities. It's awful. The same arguments that were made then were made just recently in order to get rid of Act 47. Yep. So I, I think it's going to take a courageous governor, a courageous legislature, to look Vermonters in the eye and say, this is an unsustainable problem. We have to address it. And um, 
and people need to be willing to get unelected in order to do it. I think that's what it's going to take. Because people are going to be angry when they close their little school that has 70 kids, a full-time principal. There's a certain school, and I'm not going to name where it is, but in a little town in the ski country in Vermont that has under 75 students. They have a kindergarten class with seven kids, one full-time teacher, one full-time aide, a full-time principal. And that is not a good use of taxpayer dollars. And it, that's just where I sit at this point. And I, it's very discouraging that we're tweaking the education formula and not addressing the underlying problem. I'm just going to add, it's not good for students either, because those schools don't have the same um, opportunities that we have here. You can't have a Spanish immersion pro program in a school like that, where we're able to do that here at no extra cost to taxpayers. So because we have an economy of scale. So not only is it bad for taxpayers, it's also bad for students. And it's bad socially for students. I mean, there are lots of reasons that it's bad for students. You can't attract the best teachers to those programs. It's, there are so many reasons. So I echo what you said, Floyd. And, and that, that kindergarten class with seven kids, there's one girl. Right. You know, so that girl it's, gets to live with all those boys <laughs> every day at school. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it is just not good for that kid. So, okay. And we did close the school here. We did. We, <laughs> know, we repurposed it. And I remember that, that tension. <laughs> and it was really hard. Yeah. And it was the right thing to do. Yeah. So, yes. Okay. Changing topic. Um, so, my name is Dan Clayton. I uh, live in Underhill. I've lived here since 1989. I, this was very intriguing, by the way, and your comments in particular, sorry, fine. Um, enlightening. Uh, so thank you. I came to talk about a bill that, well, well, let me just back up. I have made my living as a sales, in sales in the ski industry, broadly speaking, for my whole life. And with winters getting warmer and lift tickets at Stowe going up to $200 plus, things have changed. And we've had two bad winters. And um, the thing that I have done as I've worked all along and when I was in sales when I was much younger, I um, didn't make enough money, so I was in, I did construction, carpentry. And in the early days, a good buddy and I bought some land um, that was in foreclosure over in Stowe in 1991 or two. So fast forward to two years ago. Uh, we had built and sold houses on, uh, we ended up with four small lots over near Stowe High School, kind of out near Moscow, Vermont. <clears throat> I live here in Underhill. We built a house, uh, we built, had built and sold two houses on this property. Interestingly, we had employed uh, carpenters and tradespeople from this area and built these houses and it went smoothly. And, here we are many years later and we had mothballed two of these lots with our, so my uh, business partner is self-employed also and our thought has always been, we'll build a house on each of these lots and there's our retirement, you know? And so it's, it had gone really smoothly. We did um, a bunch of the work ourselves and again, employed a bunch of local people and you may know where I'm going with this. So these houses are both in the short-term rental world as at this moment and um, they we have a property manager who gets paid well and the people who come and ski buy their lift tickets and go out to dinner and all that stuff and now I've just read that this bill has been proposed and please forgive me for not knowing the exact process but I uh, but uh, this bill has been proposed I read about the sponsors of the bill there are some uh, progressives from Burlington I voted for both of you by the way but there are some progressives from Burlington, some folks from Barry who are co-sponsors. And what I read in the bill was very short. And I wondered if we might have gotten an abbreviated version. And I haven't seen like the whole bill, if you will. But it is, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that in order to have a short-term rental in the state of Vermont, the property would need to be owner-occupied for 100 days or more a year. And I just would like to know where both of you stand on that. And also just as a property owner, uh, I don't have a pension. I don't, that is my retirement, literally, you know, and that's what I built for. And I would just suggest that there are different 
types of ownership, and it appears to me like this law is is, is a big sort of umbrella over all short-term rentals, over all property owners, living in state, living out of state, speculative or not, you know. And I'm just hoping and trusting that folks like yourselves will <laughs> hear my concerns and at least consider those when this bill is being debated. Um, so that's it, oh. that's what I've got. <laughs> so well, thank you. There are, there are a few things, right? I mean, I'll just put it in some context, right? I don't know, I don't know this bill, but I believe I've heard something similar to H that. H-756. Thank what, you. What is it? H-756. Yeah, okay. And it might be a short form bill, that's why it's short. It probably wasn't a full blown up. You can do short form bills later in the session. So sometimes if someone missed an idea or didn't get it done, they can do these short bills. Any bill that gets submitted to committee gets changed anyway, regardless of how long or how short it is. Okay. Uh, the, I, we have about a thousand bills. In, in the House and the Senate. It'll be probably between 100 and 150 that actually make it into some form. So put that in context too, all right? Now, there has been a lot of conversation over the last few years about short-term rentals. And I, I think there's probably an argument to be made that it's, it's contributing to some of our housing issues and shortages. I'd agree with that. So I think yeah. I think Depending folks are trying that. to folks are trying to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, and you've got investment companies. It's probably not just happening in Vermont. It's probably happening in Colorado and New Hampshire, and they're buying properties or have bought properties, and then yeah. they're they're not anywhere near these properties and just getting a property manager and away they go. It's certainly lucrative to, to have done that in ski resorts and, and those kinds of areas. So. That there is some desire to regulate that marketplace. I think the other part of it is the hospitality industry or the traditional hospitality industry is also influences or is putting pressure on this conversation too. Uh, there's probably other things in that bill or being contemplated besides just that hundred day. So. It's difficult for me to say whether I would support or not support something if I if I don't have it in some context. Yeah, and I, I um, but I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, and I don't want I to do. put either of you on the spot as yeah. far as supporting or not supporting. I'm looking for your feedback, and I would just say again, as a property owner, if the if the one of the main desires was to create housing for folks who can't afford it, can't access it, or whatever. I would happily pay uh, additional taxes, as, um, particularly if I knew they weren't going into a general fund, if they were going into a fund specifically to create housing for folks who can't afford it, or give people like myself um, some sort of a mechanism, tax credits, or some something where we could go out and build housing that, that might be, you know, because one of the... Uh, I work with a lot of uh, shops over in Stowe that I sell to, and their staff have to live 45 minutes away, they can't even live near town. So I, I get it. I'm just, yeah. and your point about out of state, you know, large investors, I'm, I'm trusting that the folks who represent us will tease out the nuance here. I agree that, that it has to be addressed. It's not an all or nothing. You know, that's, I guess that's where I'm going with it. I appreciate that you said you'd be happy to pay more taxes. <laughs> no, I'm because, serious. I'll because tell if, you. if it were no. rooms and meals tax, I, that's. That's fair. But I, you one, know. Of, one of the things that we were just talking about is the education fund and all the pre pressures on the education fund. And the more homes that we have that are these short-term rentals that are non-homestead, right, non-primary residents, they pay a different tax rate. Yeah, we pay a higher tax rate. And some places you pay a lower tax rate. It depends on the, the oh, part the of the, the town that you're in, right? And they those numbers move different. They don't move at the same. They, they, they're... They're tied, but they're not. And so um, right now, a, a, the, a business, you know, um, I'm trying to think, like Poor House Pies up the road, and your place paid the same tax rate because it's non-homestead. And so we have to, in this state, figure out what these non-homestead properties are yeah. and understand which ones should be paying what kind of rates. Yeah. And that is a process. Um, for me, that's the process that I'd like to see happen. 
I don't. I think we need um, a rental registry I'm so just, that we know. We're doing that in Stowe. Or the, we know, need a statewide one. Yeah, we need a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, we need to do a lot of things yeah. statewide. Um, but so you know, I look at a bill like this and say, it's not fixing the problem. It is taking a tiny piece of it and bringing attention to it. Right. And so, if for me, I would like to see a bigger, broader um, fix to the many problems that are that. You're right, we don't have enough housing. We don't have enough workforce. Right. You know, we have three jobs open for every person that's looking for a job in Vermont. Yeah, and if folks are... And they can't move here because there's no housing. Right. So there's so many pieces that all tie together that we just have to look at it in a way that will fix more than one problem at a time and not create new problems. Well, in closing, if I could be of help to either of you down the road or whatever, I'll email both of you. I'm, I'm very open-minded about what the solutions may be. I'm just praying that it's not some broad stroke solution. And I think a lot of the people who live in the state who own their properties, who have plans like we do, would be wide open to the taxes, particularly, again, if they could go specifically to creating low-income housing or access to housing or or you know, uh, assistance with rents or whatever it may be for folks. Um, anyway, there are a lot of people in here. I if, if I may also yeah. offer that uh, you can follow this bill too. I'm not sure what committee that might be. Housing in, in general. Is, it, is yeah. House General. Yeah. Okay. So you can go to that their, their House Committee webpage and, find, and they have a list of all their bills in committee. Okay. You can click on that. Everyone uses the same process now of formatting on the website, on the web pages, yeah. and you can see where it's being taken up and testimony is being given, and you can follow it. Okay. You'll also see, if they're, t if they're serious about it, right. then you'll start to see draft 1.1, 1.2, 1 right. as they're working through language and, and addressing issues. So that's one way to stay plugged into it. And this is probably maybe just a, an initial shot over the bow to get people talking, get people involved. When, and I think it's great. I, I, you know, you can't buy a lift ticket and locals don't ski and snow anymore. I mean, lots of things have changed and we got to address it for sure. I just, sure. Yeah. But thank you. And, and there are tax credits to build low income housing. There are lots of opportunities. It's a little bit limited on the where, right? right. We're trying to make yeah. it happen in certain places, but there are that's available. Yeah, we'll, we have, have and will continue to look at that. We, uh, you know, we have to be able to get... I wish Jericho and Underhill were places yeah. where those tax credits were available, personally. So did you want to say so something, Floyd? It's funny you should mention this because my sister called me in a panic. Now, mind you, she lives in Massachusetts. Okay. Um, she owns the family camp. There used to be five siblings who owned it. Now she owns the family camp. It's actually two camps. After the flood, they had to rehabilitate both camps. They rehabilitated them, it was so expensive, they ended up doing them as short-term rentals. These camps are winterized, um, are not winterized, I'm sorry. Neither one of them is winterized. So this bill, it says you need to live in the house 123 days a year, um, or you get this much higher tax rate. Well, the total number of days that those camps are actually Inhabitable. usable <laughs> right. is about 150 days. <laughs> so that, that ain't happening. Yeah. You know, so there's there's a lot of nuance here, right? Like with your situation and with her situation, where the legislature. What I love about the legislative process in Vermont is that when you see that bill coming up for testimony, you can call that committee chair, you can call that committee assistant. And say, I want to testify on this. Bill. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. You can. Okay. Any Vermont, you, you can go in and listen anytime you want to. Right. So what they're talking that about, idea. but you can right. also testify, yeah. and you should be heard. Yeah. You know, it's really, and there's a lot of nuance. This is a short. It's a short form bill. It's kind of a placeholder. Right. It's saying there's an issue. We want to address it, and they go to ledge council and they have something drafted up that sort of addresses what it is that they want, but then the longer form bill will have the nuance. It's really, and that, so follow it. I don't think there, I may have had a text conversation with a certain member of that committee this week, um, and I was reassured that they were not likely to pick it up this year, yeah. but that there was real motivation on the part of some members who were sponsoring it right. to get it taken up. Yeah, um, yeah, really. What I worry about is that it gets tacked on at the end of the session 
this one, on one of the Christmas trees that, that we, they're called Christmas trees. It's a tree you put all these ornaments on. It's language that- Our federal government's gonna- Language that issue. <laughs> so it, it ends up, but I, I hope that won't happen. Okay. Um, but it's worth paying attention. Yeah, we, yeah, we will. All right, well, again, thank you. I took enough of everyone's time, but- Thank you. Thanks for listening. Okay. I, I was want to get this in before your seven o'clock arrives. <laughs> um, I, I wonder what you think. If is there any possibility about this wealth tax passing? Because yeah. what I read about it, I thought that's a great idea. I don't think. I I just I wonder how many people in Vermont there are who have that those kind of assets or. And, and probably a whole lot more than I thought, but that seems like that could help the education fund. Yeah, it's in uh, it's in House Ways and Means right now. Uh, the sponsor is the chair, oh. along with other members of the committee. Uh, whether it's going to get traction or not, I was asking the question today, and I didn't get a direct answer on it. Uh, it's obviously going to be a, a partisan effort. Uh, the question always with those kinds of bills, I certainly support it. Uh, I think uh, you know, a lot of a lot of folks that don't support something like that would say, "Well, people are just going to leave the state." But if you look at the research and the data around that, that's not really true. Yeah. So that doesn't really happen. And when you talk to folks that are in that income range, they tend to be of the opinion, "Okay." I can afford to do that. As a matter of fact, you think about some of the federal tax cuts that took place a few years ago, you know, these people, those people, if I can say it that way, have really benefited from those tax changes. Not, not the Biden administration, but the prior administration, right? So uh, what's been proposed and what I'm aware of, it's, it could be as much as $100 million a year. And, and we have some real needs. We have an administration that refuses to raise fees and things like that just to keep up with inflation. And we're putting enormous pressure. I mean, the last few years we've had a large guess of money because of uh, small state minimums and federal funding and stuff like that. But that's not sort of a normal state of things. And all of our departments and agencies are under-resourced. And uh, it's, you can, the pressure that's being, I'm diverting, going off a little bit on a tangent here, but I was looking at some data the other day that we were looking at the workforce within state government and hires and things like that. And in the first year of new hires for the state of Vermont, 40% leave. 40%. Yeah, it's just it's, it's just too much. It, it's I it's, used to it's do a human very resources. difficult work. A lot um, of people join, go and 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 want to do this work because a lot of people are mission driven. You think about the agency of natural resources, environmental okay. issues, things like that. A lot of folks want to do that work, but it becomes very difficult. I'm sorry to digress a little bit there, but I I don't know, uh, but I, but I hope they do pursue it. And all I want to say is it's an income tax. It's not a wealth tax, right? It's not a tax for, for what you have. It's a tax for what you're earning. So it's a little bit of a misnomer that we're calling it a wealth tax. But that's just a personal issue, not, a, not an issue with anything else. What I read said that they would also look at assets. So that accepted like that. That would be more of a wealth tax. And that's a lot more complicated. Yeah, I think yeah, they were yeah. looking to raise like seventy million through just a, an increase in the income tax, and then yeah. uh, uh, non-income tax funds uh, would be taxed in some way or assess some fee in some way. And then that'd be the other thirty million dollars, so twenty-five, thirty million. Do we currently Thanks. tax under the income at all? No. Yeah, which is why it's a whole lot more complicated. Go ahead. Um, my name is Kate Blossom. I live in Jericho um, on Nashville Road. I emailed both of you about 
um, some issues with the beekeepers. And the About what? I'm sorry? Beekeepers. I'm glad you Oh, bee, okay. The pollinator stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, yes, the pollinator stuff. So I'm actually, it's sort of like two issues that are related, but in a very complex and nuanced way. Um, I'm a beekeeper. Uh, I have some bees at my home in, in Nashville, and then I work for Mike Palmer of French Hill Apiaries, who's like a internationally renowned beekeeper who just celebrated his 50th year of beekeeping. Um, and he is in Franklin County. Um, so some of you may have heard a recent news report that Vermont's bees were like healthier and more robust than ever. And then two days later, another news report that the Vermont beekeepers were like, this is patently false. Um, uh, so, um, there have been issues that the beekeepers have been having with communication with the Agency of Agriculture, in particular the department that the apiary program is under. And I, I'm just like curious about a path forward from your perspective as legislators, kind of. Um, that's a nuanced conversation that does sort of play into the bill that's currently um, in the House, it's H706, and it would restrict the use of neonicotinoid treated yeah. seeds, mm -hmm. which New York State just did, and Quebec does as well. Um, so there's a lot of data there. What we've been seeing at French Hill, I started working for Mike in 2011, and mind you, Mike is like surrounded by corn, right? All of Franklin County is corn. It's just like neonicotinoids as far as you can see. Uh, when I first started working for Mike, every year we'd go around in the spring, 95% alive, 90% alive, 98% alive, until 2015 or 16 when things like really started tanking and have been tanking for beekeepers like across the state and country. One of the numbers for Vermont like colony mortality in the past two or three years was 85%. Um, so there uh, is a, a studies are showing that neonicotinoids are contributing to what they call colony collapse disorder. Um, they also, the bees are dealing with a lot of pests um, that are very virulent and the viruses keep evolving and the bees keep dying but like what we're starting to see and believe, especially as we see the data coming in, is not only do the neonicotinoid treated seeds not improve crop yields, but they move through the soil and water. They're being so they're being taken up by other plants around so that the goldenrod and dandelion that the bee, bee lab is testing have neonicotinoids in them. And it is, is expressed throughout the plant, so it goes into the pollen, which is fed to the baby bees. Um, and this is also affecting native bees. In Vermont, a third of them are at risk, says the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. So I'm curious about your position on the bill, or happy to like provide more information. It, it runs right up into dairy. Um, and I, my sense is that this is what Extension told the farmers to do, or the uh, seed companies told Extension to do it, and Extension told the farmers. So I have a lot of... Um, sympathy for the dairy farmers and they're already dealing with like so much um, but the data does show that it doesn't improve crop yields so I'm, I'm curious where you stand but I'm also really curious on your thoughts about this sort of communication barrier with the agency of ag and that might be a longer the uh, if I may yeah, yeah I, I would, I'll just be really quick okay. because this is not an area of expertise for mm -hmm. me. Um, what I did see is the data out of Quebec that says yes. after four years of limitation, the bee population increased and the crop yield was almost identical. Right. So I thought that was really promising. Um, and I'm looking to the agriculture um, committee to do the hard work because again, it's not an area of expertise. I could talk days on a lot of other things this yeah. is that's you hit my limit that's it that's all i got well the data is compelling so i'm <laughs> glad that will move that will um, be yeah a, I've, a strong I've, consideration yeah i've been a spot co-sponsor on that legislation a couple it, it's um, been going through yeah some this one is much more specific I yeah think. uh I, I don't catch them all and, so, and sometimes 
I, I don't sign on to bills inappropriate as being a member of appropriations if there's money in the bill because it's a little bit of a conflict for me and the committee that I'm on. But I've always supported that. I know the sponsors of, of this work. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm fully behind doing that. Uh, uh, as far as uh, I recognize what the problems are, as far as uh, working through the AG, yeah. Agency of Agriculture, uh, I, I, I don't know that I can offer uh, something specific in terms of dealing with the agency, but the House Committee on Agriculture and yeah. what do we call it now and something else? Resilience? Forestry, Forestry and, and food resilience. Yeah. 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 And, that, uh, yeah. The, it, the chair of that committee is much more open to these conversations than a former chair. I was thinking the vice chair also might be. I don't know who's the vice chair. Her name Heather? is Heather Supernaut. Heather. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she so would be. She'd be open yeah. herself. Either of them. So. But 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 Dave Durfee, who is the mm -hmm. uh, is, oh, is, is, is the chair, he's he's very approachable. Okay. Uh, I'd love I'm to trying to think of who else is on that. That would be great. It's really it's very concerning. That's what the beekeepers are sort of like up against with the agency of agriculture, and. Uh, you probably won't be surprised to know that that is just like the tip of the iceberg like that this news report came out like that just sort of reveals like how bad the problem is so the beekeepers have been dealing with this for a couple of years um, and yeah I, I, I think, think yeah there is a um, in many departments in government right now there is a wall between the legislature and the departments oh, okay. and there is so it's not only ag it's you know it's yeah. and it's it's um wait between the legislature and the and the, and the agency and the agency and the departments there's there's a lot of um it's it's not a smooth open relationship okay. where, i mean this is one of those things that when i got there i'm like oh that's not what i expected yeah so um maybe i was naive but it was not what I would expect. Yeah, what I expected. Not what I would expect. Um, and um, so there's a more of a concerted effort this year when we're when especially budget time when we're talking to the agency to to agencies at least in my committee to say are you fully staffed? How are you dealing with what your you know what your areas of control are? Um, what kind of supports do you need? What kind of problems are you having? Just to have more of those conversations. And the more we hear from folks in the field, the better information we have to yeah. have those conversations. That's. I got a quick one. H uh, 525 was introduced in the Government Operations Committee this past week. Okay. It would allow municipalities to prohibit firearms in municipal buildings. So it leaves it up to the municipality, but it does enable them to prohibit them if they choose, which I think is a great idea. And I'm hoping that as it moves through committee, you guys will pay a little attention to it. It looked pretty straightforward to me. I agree. And I would support it. I, I don't know what the process, you know, what, where that's going to go. But It's got bipartisan support. James Harrison and Angela Arsenal are the two main uh, two okay. Angela was well that's good she was one that's of the good main yeah. Sponsors. yeah and they did pick it up and they did introduce it so they're they haven't started hearing testimony on it but I'm hoping that in the next week or two I'm hoping that it'll make it out in time yeah. I mean he's right to point out that there's bipartisan support for that but again you're in that thousand bills and, and, and yep. the priorities that are set by leadership in our committees to work on certain things and my uh, hope is that there's not a lot of complicating language in this bill it's like one thing and it's, it's all. I'm hope yes it looks pretty <laughs> simple I'm hoping they can squeeze it out <laughs> well, it's simple a, it's things short come, form. become complex I, I, understand. <laughs> I totally understand yeah. I don't want to step on anybody else if somebody else has something to say I want to respond to what you were saying. The Agency of Agriculture is dominated by dairy. Oh, yeah. The, the Secretary of Agriculture is a dairyman. Mm -hmm. Wonderful man, nice guy, but he's dairy. Floyd served right. on the Ag Committee. I was on the Agriculture Committee. Dairy yeah. is king in Vermont. When I, get I was there, it was 80% of the agricultural I get economy. It. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's down to something like 65 or 70%. But 
what happens when these conflicting things come up is Gary walks in, dominates the conversation, and everybody else gets shut out. I get that. So that's where the bill is going. But the, the beekeeper situation, does, dairy is not involved there. Good. <laughs> you know, that's like, I mean, dairy is involved because lots of beekeepers have their apiaries on, on dairy farms, of course, because that's the landscape. But the bee, this beekeeper issue, it's not, a, you know, like, it's not, it doesn't really fall under that rubric. Yeah, it doesn't. The bill definitely, that's where the, the I, I get that the bill will hit up against that like very quickly. Although the, the data is very compelling that it's not actually helping the dairy farmers and it's poisoning the soil and water. Any other questions? I think we could probably take one more if there is one. Otherwise, we could say good evening. Thank you for being yeah. here. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, we, we, we think it's important to do this. Yeah.